Hello. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Maria Heiler and I'm Deputy Director of the Washington DC Office and Senior Researcher at Learning Policy Institute. LPI is a nonprofit educational research and policy think tank that conducts and communicates independent high quality research to improve education policy and practice in ways that support empowering and equitable learning for each and every child. We appreciate you all for attending this webinar, Bridging the Continuum, Teacher Preparation and Induction for Deeper Learning. It's, a, it's the third in our series, State Efforts for Building an Effective Diverse Teacher Workforce. The first and second webinars can be assessed by visiting NABSEs and Learning Forward's websites. They're also linked in the comment box. Leveraging S's Title II for Job Embedded Professional Development and how teacher leadership, career ladders, and relicensure can support teaching for deeper learning. This webinar will close out a series that has drawn connections between systems of professional learning and the wider career continuum, including quality preparation, early career supports, and ongoing development and advancement all in the service of expanding deeper learning opportunities for all students. So we will start by framing the discussion prior to having a moderated discussion with all of our guests, and then we'll open it for audience questions at the end. I'd like to take this time to offer a special thank you to our partners, Learning Forward, National Association of State Boards of Education, and National Conference of State Legislators for working together to forward this important work. I'd like to remind you all that resources are available in the top chat box and in our follow-up email, the time for, um, and the time for questions is at the end. Resources are also available on the event page. So I'd like to start with um, first defining what we mean by deeper learning. Deeper learning refers to the understanding and use of complex content knowledge as it is applied to new contexts and situations. It's the 21st century knowledge and skills we want our students to be able to know and be able to do. So they include the mastery of academic content knowledge for application and transfer, critical thinking and problem solving, communication and collaboration, metacognition, and the development of academic mindsets. When we think about teacher preparation for deeper learning as the teaching skills needed to, be, to enable students to acquire and master these competencies, and I'll share a little bit about that later. Um, the goal of education systems should be that all teachers have the capacity to teach in ways that develop deeper learning capacities for all students. So one challenge to the goal of such a teacher workforce is that there can be a disconnect between expectations and learning and preparation and what new teachers often encounter in their initial years teaching. So what is expected of a teacher to earn licensure and graduate, graduate from a program may not align or look much like the systems of a professional learning and evaluation um, system at the district level. Early career induction programs or district or state-led early career supports can be a structure to support the bridge between pre-service and in-service teaching. Such an effort to create better prepared new teachers and support early career teachers increases the likelihood of retaining them long-term. LPI is currently exploring the elements of quality teacher preparation with the goal of understanding how teacher preparation can support deeper learning in the classroom for all students. So in our study of teacher preparation, I think we can go back a couple of slides. We found five domains of deeper learning that demonstrate learning environments that are rich in deeper learning experiences. They are learning is applied and transferred, Learning is developmentally grounded and personalized. Learning occurs in productive communities of practice. Learning is contextualized. And learning is equitable and socially just oriented. These domains represent elements that are important inside of K-12 classrooms, but as importantly, they represent the learning that teacher candidates were experiencing as they became teachers in the sites that we studied. It's very hard to create learning experiences when you've never experienced those yourself, so it's vital that teacher preparation programs create such experiences for their teachers who are learning to teach. Since we're focusing 
on the bridge between preparation and early career, there are some structures and supports that surface from the study that has implications for connecting pre-service and induction. Ways that programs in our study supported a bridge were standards, performance assessments, and authentic partnerships with K-12 districts. The programs had common visions of teaching that were indicated in their standards, standards that are aligned with district and state standards as well. In this way, teacher candidates were being prepared and assessed in ways that were aligned with the same expectations that hiring districts, districts held. In addition, the programs also employed performance assessments that helped candidates know precisely what practices they were strong in and, in which, and those in which they needed continued professional development. These assessments can serve as a guide map for more personalized coaching and modeling during their early career mentoring. Finally, the programs in the study had authentic reciprocal relationships with K-12 districts. They weren't just places to put their teacher candidates. Instead, K-12 faculty were seen as partners in the development of the new teachers. University classes were often taught in school classrooms. Higher ed faculty were often in schools, supporting professional development or whole school and district initiatives. So there were really um, strong, authentic relationships between teacher preparation and K-12 districts, um, key to supporting the bridge between in-service and pre-service teaching. So now I'd like to turn to a group of individuals who explore the policies that support building a continuum from teacher prep to professional learning systems that help ensure every student has access to deeper learning opportunities. Part of this discussion will include the role of partnerships at all levels in a state system that support this bridging and alignment. First, I'd like to introduce you to Representative Robert Benning. He's a member of the National Conference of State Legislators Phase One and Phase Two International Education Study Group chair of the Indiana House Education Committee and co-chair of NCSL's Education Standing Committee and an NCSL Early Education Fellow. Next, I'd like to introduce Sandra Hinderleiter. He is an education educator preparation lead at the Center for Instructional Support in the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Sandra Lee's Massachusetts education preparation work where 70 providers endorse a total of over 5,000 educators each year. Margaret McKenna is President Emerita from Le Leslie University in Massachusetts. She's a member of the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. She served as the Deputy White House Counsel, as Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Education, and headed the education transition team for President Clinton. She is a former president of the Walmart Foundation as well. Finally, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Tuttleson. Dr. Tuttleson is executive director of Talent Pipeline for Louisiana's Department of Education and has served in multiple leadership roles over her 25 years at the local and state level. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the conversation. And I'd like to get started with asking um, you, Representative Benning, could you just um, start us off by highlighting how Indi Indiana is creating a system of quality teacher preparation and supporting new teachers entering the classroom? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm gonna begin by um, thanking um, everyone involved, uh, Learning Policy Institute and National Association of State Board. Um, I, uh, Indiana has, I've had the opportunity as in the introduction to spend a uh, couple of years with NCSL doing this uh, deep dive into um, international education where a lot of the countries that are outperforming us currently have taken research developed by um, many of our institutions in, in the United States and put it into practice. Uh, one, of the, one of the programs that I've had an opportunity to work with, uh, I actually work uh, for Marion University uh, which is a, I think the seventh largest uh, teacher prep program in the state of Indiana, but it's a non-public university. And when I came to Marion several years ago, we were able to, um, we were in the process of redesigning our teacher prep program. I was on the leadership team. So we have been able to basically integrate a lot of what we, um, a lot of what you've already kind of addressed, as well as a lot of what was discussed at the International Study Committee into our program. 
we have uh, started by having rigorous admissions, uh, more rigorous admissions criteria. We knew that from the rest of the world, they were recruiting teachers from the top half of entering freshmen. Um, the United States traditionally comes from the bottom half, so we uh, decided we need to increase our rigor as well as uh, have a uh, performance uh, portfolio so they could demonstrate their ability to connect. We will have all of our students uh, will have a content major, even in elementary, We will, uh, which is something else we found very common in some international competitors. Even in elementary, they have math, science specialists. Um, our teachers are taught um, from day one. They begin in the K-12 environment uh, in the freshman year, but we also have uh, teacher simulation labs, which was developed by the University of Michigan and ETS, um, so that students have an opportunity numerous times to teach in front of avatars um, and have them all sorts of different levels of uh, demonstration in terms of the student reaction, et cetera. All of our students will, um, we no longer will be graduating students with a bachelor's degree at Marion. We will only have a master's degree. And we also are um, requiring a, um, which, which will be paid for um, at, at the, the fifth year of the program, depending on how many, either year four or five, depending on how many years, uh, how many credits you bring in the program. We are requiring, in that fifth year, we are requiring a one year residency where we are partnering with uh, local school districts um, and they will uh, pay the, the residents, so that will be a paid residency and their master degree will be paid for at the same time. Uh, we are a TAP school, so we are very uh, intent in terms of making sure that we are driving down to the data to make sure that, that teachers can uh, directly uh, impact student performance. And then the last component we have embedded was a study abroad component so that all of our students will have an opportunity to study abroad in a uh, high-performing country. I just got back from South Korea where we spent two weeks uh, looking at the teacher prep programs as well as uh, visiting schools and learning how teachers are trained as well as how they um, uh, teach in the classroom. The state of Indiana, we have uh, been looking at, um, we're kind of, I think, a shining star right now in terms of development programs right now in Indiana, but we are also um, looking at expanding residencies and making residency a, um, we, we spent last summer in an study committee studying that our budget year will be next year. So we're hopeful that we will be able to include um, funding available for residencies. And we also, several years ago, created what's called Next Generation Who's Your Educators, where the, um, we provide an additional $7,500 per year, which is stackable on other state aid for uh, students who want to go into teaching um, and they have to be in the top 20% of their class um, and uh, then they also have to compete uh, as a competitive uh, scholarship. We uh, currently are offering 200 uh, slots per year um, for uh, all four years of their teaching or their uh, or higher ed experience and then they will have to teach in an Indiana school for five years upon graduation. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about, I talked a little bit about increased rigor that we're pushing. Uh, we have pushed that as well in public policy and as well at Marion. Uh, Marion, our, our cohort, first cohort that in the new program was this year, and our uh, previous year cohort had a starting GPA of 3.16. Uh, SAT of 1,006 and only had 7.8% minority. Um, for the first cohort of a new program, our GPA jumped to 3.6. Average GPA um, SAT is 1132 and our minority percentage is 21.7%. For the class of 18, we jumped from, uh, again, to a 3.7 GPA. 1143 SAT. Unfortunately, our minority is uh, not as high as we'd like. We want to get to 40%, but we're at 16.4%. We've actually doubled our enrollment from 16 to um, uh, 19, um, or to the fall of 18. Um, so it, it proves that increasing rigor and selectivity, uh, if you couple that with an active recruitment policy, you can actually get more uh, high qualified students engaged in education, but um, we have taken, worked very closely with our state board. I actually uh, had a discussion with them just last night, a couple of our state board members in terms of how we can start uh, taking some of the best practices that Marion 
is implementing and how we can state, take that statewide. The governor's just released last fall his uh, talent and workforce uh, plan, and we are um, providing uh, the Commission for Higher Ed the authority to start having more direct input in terms of uh, teacher prep quality programs and how we can align those. And uh, in the next session, we hope to um, take and do more in terms of incentives, in terms of state student aid to kind of direct uh, programs towards a higher rigor, more uh, a program that's more focused on making sure students are ready on day one and having residencies and options like that available to them. That's very exciting. Um, it sounds like Indiana has really made some key investments and some key resources. Um, has, have, have, you have really channeled some key resources into um, strengthening teacher preparation in the state. I was wondering, um, Sandra, if you could say a little bit about what the work is looking like in Massachusetts and um, if you would chime in, Jennifer, that would be great. Sure, so this is Sandra. Um, and here in Massachusetts, we um, have actually followed the three different principles that Maria outlined earlier in terms of thinking about standards, performance assessments, and authentic partnerships. That's absolutely what we have been doing here in Massachusetts. Um, so it, this started in 2012 when our board passed some updated regulations that both elevated our expectations around what it would mean for teachers to be fully prepared uh, to meet the needs of their students on day one, but it also uh, pushed us to more deeply aligned K-12 with educator preparation, really intentionally creating that bridge between the two so that there could be a more streamlined process from the moment someone identifies that they would like to be an educator all the way through to completing a program and then being inducted and mentored in uh, pre-K-12 public school in Massachusetts. Um, and so what we did was we, we looked at the standards that we had for our in-service educators, and we broke them down to identify, we worked with a field to break that down and identify of all of these standards, what are the most essential elements that a new teacher absolutely cannot go into a classroom in full responsibility without meeting these expectations. Uh, and through that, we identified our, our six most essential elements. Um, and, and used that to develop our performance assessment that every candidate, every teaching candidate would have to go through and demonstrate uh, proficiency with in order to be endorsed for licensure in Massachusetts. Um, this process, so we call it our candidate assessment of performance, uh, sorry, candidate assessment of performance, it is exactly modeled off of our educator evaluation system upon which we evaluate our pre-K-12 educators which both sets up our candidates to know what the expectations will be of them once they get into the field, but it's also meant that our cooperating teachers here in Massachusetts, we call them our supervising practitioners who are those licensed educators uh, mentoring and supporting our candidates during their practicum experiences are also fully knowledgeable and deeply embedded within that system as well, and they're able to make sure that they're fully supporting our candidates. And we've just received a ton of positive feedback, both from our educator preparation side, as well as from uh, teachers in the pre-K-12 schools that are partnering with those ed prep to, um, to, to talk about how that clear alignment between the two makes them better supervisors. Uh, and, and again, just hold the bar higher for our candidates themselves. Um, we also, in terms of the authentic partnerships piece, we explicitly outlined a domain for educator preparation um, that they need to demonstrate in our accountability system for these programs. So when we review these programs, as, as Maria mentioned, we have about 70 across the state, one of the things that we explicitly look for evidence of is the extent to which they are intentionally partnering with their pre-K-12 schools and districts, not just to have a placement where a student can do their student teaching, but really thinking more broadly about how are they addressing the needs of those pre-K-12 schools and districts, both while the candidates are candidates, but also when they're thinking about hiring, when they're thinking about that induction and mentoring piece. Um, so we're, we're really pushing our educator preparation programs to be responsive of those needs of their, of their partner districts, which has formed, which has allowed them to form more authentic and robust partnerships that better serve candidates themselves as well as the students. 
Um, and then we get to our induction and mentoring. So a few years ago, uh, we updated our induction and mentoring guidelines. And since that time, we've been doing an annual report to really try and understand how districts are implementing induction and mentoring. It is a requirement of all districts to have a two-year induction and mentoring process, um, but we wanted to make sure that we're collecting data to understand what that looks like. The data that we're collecting, it's going to inform some updated guidelines that we're working on this year. Again, further bringing into alignment more significantly what's happening with preparation and what's happening um, in pre-K-12. We do have a few examples of, of, of districts that have started thinking about how they can leverage training of, of preparation in, um, in their induction and mentoring. So we have a couple of regions here in Massachusetts who have identified an educator preparation program that they partner with to offer the professional development and support through their induction and mentoring program. It sounds like you've really um, made some key efforts at the state to think about um, the full continuum and to really develop um, ways that preparation can um, work together very deeply with K-12 districts and not in a shallow manner. And it sounds like it's been really successful in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, Jennifer, one of the links that, that, that was just sent out over the chat is our uh, prep, a partnership toolkit. So if folks mm -hmm. are thinking about what this could look like, that's the toolkit that we put together to help and just kind of reinforce what it is that uh, organizations and districts might want to think about as they engage, start engaging in this robust partnership. That's fabulous. Thank you for so much for sharing that. Uh, Jennifer, can you talk a little bit what's going on in Louisiana and um, how you all are working with building alignment between preparation and induction? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maria. Um, hi, this is Jennifer Tuttleton from uh, Louisiana Department of Education, and um, I would like to commend Robert on what he described was happening um, in Indiana because Louisiana and also like Massachusetts are taking on a lot of those efforts around um, the whole redesign of teacher preparation um, Sandra had mentioned um, about, uh, you know, bridging between pre-service and in-service um, that you had talked about, Maria, around standards and performance assessment and authentic and what I really liked is what you said is reciprocal partnerships. And so Louisiana, for over the past decade, we've been really working um, to bridge this gap and create really strong partnerships. Um, so for us, it's been more about alignment between preparation and workforce and how we, we fill that void. And so, um, matter of fact, um, Maria, if someone could put us on slide one of mine, that might help create a landscape. Thank you. Um, so, you know, uh, acting on the belief here in Louisiana of high expectations to help students succeed in the classroom and beyond, um, we've also raised the expectation for preparation programs, and schools and districts, gosh, in Louisiana, um, have gone to great lengths to improve the quality of education for students across Louisiana. But you can see back in 2000, um, uh, when schools and districts were adopting new curriculum, revamping their professional development programs, uh, using our teacher evaluation system to provide feedback, um, we were busy at the preparation ele um, level back in 2011 where our preparation programs created teams um, dedicated to understanding all of this new body of work, the new content standards that align to the assessments. Um, in addition to that, the department trained faculty um, at the preparation level um, on COMPASS, the state's evaluation system. and then. Uh, beginning in the fall of 2013, universities started integrating that into their curriculum. Um, we've developed advisory councils and other partnerships in, involving um, TK-12 partners to use input um, to make improvement processes. Um, we really looked to um, our field of teachers um, in order to find out, though, were these efforts making the um, marked improvements that we wanted. And so we reached out by doing a survey of over 6,000 educators. And if you'll you turn to slide two, I'd like to address that. And what we found out through this body of work is that we weren't actually um, preparing teachers to be prepared, um, as Sandra said, on day one. 
And so to better understand this through the survey, um, what we found were the most prominent themes that emerged from survey results was one, school systems of preparation programs agreed that teacher candidates need more hands-on experience prior to entering the classroom. Hence, our adoption of long residencies um, under the tutelage of a high-quality um, mentor. And we also found that preparation program and school systems generally agreed on what should be taught. But what we also found is there was such a disconnect um, that you spoke about, Maria, earlier, where uh, learning and skills were not being transferred. And the third thing is that um, school systems experience the shortages of teachers in specific subject areas that were not coordinating with what the preparation program was doing on the recruitment side. So if you advance to the next slide, um, we took a real tactical approach in 2014 where we had launched, I'm sorry, you can advance to the next one. Um, with, uh, we launched an initiative in 2014, um, now known as Believe and Prepare, and this included 41 Louisiana school systems and 24 preparation providers, um, and it impacted basically about 1,300 aspiring, um, men, um, aspiring mentor teachers. And um, through this grant program, districts and their preparation partners were awarded funds to prepare aspiring teachers and to um, incentivize that collaboration uh, that was much needed based on our survey results. Um, in 2016, our board approved updated regulations to expand year-long residencies and, um, that were based on a, uh, a competency type of curriculum, and we've, um, and we've elevated that um, statewide to the point where we have now um, had over 850 aspiring teachers who've benefited through these partnerships and the year-long residencies. Um, Additionally, over 35 school systems and nearly all of our 27 preparation providers in Louisiana have partnered to implement um, full year residencies to point. Um, like um, our, our friends in Massachusetts, um, we have also instituted some um, incentive uh, pay where we are uh, developing high quality mentors and we have developed a funding source where we can pay our mentors towards uh, a stipend for this body of work along with working with preparation programs where we can um, offset some expenses by providing stipends um, at the residency level as well. I love the use of data um, that you talked about, Jennifer, in terms of um, surveying 6,000 of your teachers and really hearing from teachers um, what they need and what they want and their perspective. That's so key. Um, and I appreciate uh, the redesign efforts that you've been going through in Louisiana, um, especially as, as in um, in Louisiana, as in Indiana, the use of residencies is a um, key to a high retention pathway. So uh, investing resources and to those types of um, programs with a full year of mentoring with a um, high quality mentor teacher is key to retaining our um, teachers over a long haul. And you've all, you've all talked about partnerships. I'd like to turn to Margaret for um, a moment. And um, I'm curious about the work that you're doing um, at the state level and if there are other partners in the work. We've heard about partnerships between K-12 districts and the education preparation programs, but are there other partners in this work and um, who have you had the opportunity to partner with in your role? So I, I can go back to, you know, many roles as the president of Leslie, actually, uh, we had uh, residency and partnership programs 50 years ago. So not a new idea, um, uh, both with uh, private schools, Shady Hill, Buckingham, Brown and Nichols, and with public schools, we had residencies before they were even popular. So uh, I, I guess the time has come. but. You know, I, 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 I'm encouraged by listening to everybody, uh, particularly Representative Benning uh, in the work he's been involved in, but I, I, I don't want to throw cold water on what people are saying, but, you know, go back to what NCSL uh, report No Time to Lose uh, came out with uh, in terms of uh, the talk in other countries. Other countries talk about having the best 
teachers in the world. It's something we seldom hear of in this country. We talk about having the best students, and we're worried about our students being competitive. But we seldom talk about having the best teachers in the world, and I don't think we do enough to do that. While Sandra talks about, uh, you know, concentrating on, on our, our 70 preparation programs and the standards we hold them to, we also have alternative programs in Massachusetts where people walk into our classrooms and they do around the country with seven weeks of preparation, having passed tests and having seven weeks of preparation before they walk into a classroom uh, with no mentor teacher and have their own classroom. So, you know, uh, and I think, you know, if we're serious about this, we're going to do the kinds of things that Representative Benning and others have talked about here which is we're gonna do true preparation, we're gonna give teachers support, we're gonna mentor them, we're gonna pay them, we're gonna give them career ladders, we're gonna give them time, uh, and we're gonna give them career ladders to be master teachers, not to be administrators. We're gonna give them comparative pay, and we're not gonna allow people to teach our kids uh, when they've had no classroom experience and they're not being mentored. And we're allowing that to happen all over the country. Uh, and we, and the, we do not allow that to happen in other countries that do well. We're also gonna make sure that our, our teaching course is diverse, that they're culturally competent. And I think one of the things that was learned in the study of No Time uh, to Lose was that all the teachers in those countries had serious special education uh, learning, all the teachers in all the classrooms. And, and it really helped to have, have that for all students because it makes everybody a better teacher and everybody able to, to uh, uh, identify and work with, teachers, with students with any kind of learning disability. So I think the things we've heard today are all great, but I think that attracting and keeping the kinds of students that Representative Benning and uh, others have talked about is gonna be an effort unless we do all the other things uh, in terms of support, in terms of pay, uh, in terms of diversity, cultural competency. Also in terms of allowing teachers to teach uh, in terms of creativity. And I think one of the issues around testing, and I am not anti-testing at all, but we have to be really careful about what has become in some places teaching to the test as opposed to testing what people are learning. Because we wanna make sure that our classrooms are, are places where teachers who are great can be creative and innovative, and that's what keeps good teachers in the classroom. And we want our best teachers to be teaching in the most challenging classrooms and schools, uh, and uh, so that our uh, our students who need the best teachers get the best teachers. So uh, we need to do more in all of that, and we need to. You know, my parents were both public school teachers their whole lives. And if I put my mother and my father and my aunt together, we come up with 118 years of teaching. So there's no one who respects teachers more than I do. Uh, and I think that's something our country needs to come back to. Now that's an era when the best students went into teaching and then we had a lull, as, as Representative Benning says, where we went into the bottom half of the class. We need to do everything we can to attract uh, again and keep again uh, the kind of students we want in teaching and therefore the respect for teachers and good teaching. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I think um, a lot of what you mentioned aligns um, the, the types of teachers that we want in classrooms aligns with the deeper learning competencies. I um, spoke about the domains earlier. And I think one of the things we need to think about is often like, why are the bottom half of the students, the bottom half of the classroom, right? So. Mm -hmm if we would encourage and have teachers who are able to engage in deeper learning for all students, there will be no bottom half of the classroom and all of our students will um, have the types of knowledge and skills available to be excellent teachers. And I appreciate your point, um, Margaret, that um, we need to shine light on the fact that our teachers are some of the greatest teachers in the world and um, acknowledge that and um, help, help people to realize that teaching is a really important um, 
profession and um, stop um, stop always putting out the challenges, but also um, the rewards and to provide those incentives and resources, um, compensation for teachers so that um, it is a viable profession for um, people who want to engage, who want to enter the profession. So I, Margaret got us started. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, if I, this is Representative Baining, if I could just comment briefly on a couple things Margaret said, which um, I know that some of the research Linda Darling Hammond has done, and, and we have found in terms of our international study, the special ed component you talk about, there's no question that um, the rest of the world, and one, I mean, we spend more money on K-12 in all but four countries, but they're able to drive more money in a classroom, and one of the ways they do it is in different classroom structure, size, things like that. But they also, uh, when you talk about special ed, you, you hit the nail on the head, they have all their teachers tend to have better um, uh, education support in terms of special ed, so they don't do as much pull-out separation. Their uh, teachers are better able to meet those needs. And I also applaud with you, Margaret, when you say talk about um, career ladders, we also learned uh, very clearly that uh, in those high-performing countries, they have career ladders, even in China. When I was in China, uh, when you think of a communist country, I was talking to the president of Normal University, and, and he retorted back to me, Representative Bainey, you live in a capitalistic society. You know how to uh, reward high performance in every part of your economy, but teaching. And uh, so Indiana actually has adopted a program called Career Pathways or Opportunity Culture and was negotiated into the largest school districts um, in the state of Indiana's um, a collective bargaining agreement where they're paying up to uh, almost $20,000 more per year for teachers to stay in the classroom but take on uh, lead teacher roles. So you have high performing educators staying there as opposed to moving into the uh, administration. And the last time you would you bring up in terms of respect, uh, Representative um, Sharon Nico Sanchez and I spoke on Monday on NCSL's behalf to the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification, and that was one of the questions that came up, and um, we both agreed that it, you know, we cannot legislate um, uh, respect, but it's something we all kind of need to work together on hand-in-hand, uh, -hand, legislators, policymakers, and educators, but, um, you know, I think you will find, especially if you elevate the requirements that, um, as we have done in the program in Marion, you know, people will come and they will uh, engage and you'll have a higher level of respect when you have um, people perceive it to be a much more rigorous um, uh, program to get into. So I think you hit a number of nails on the head, Margaret. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on, we have a very excited, interested audience and have several questions and I'd like to um, turn to the rest of the time to um, respond to some of those, if that's all right. We have one question, um, if you could um, address this, um, perhaps, Margaret, and then we'll go to um, Jennifer. Um, would love to hear any suggestions for how state boards can evaluate their programs for deeper learning domains. What should we look at and what questions should we ask? Well, I think we have to find a way to do assessments that uh, that are deeper than uh, paper and pencil testing. I think I'm not saying that that uh, student performance should not be a part of it, but I think we have found that it, that it that it is not the only way to do things. And I think one of the things that uh, that teachers have objected to is that their evaluation is based on just standardized testing. I think no one's objected that standardized testing can be a piece of it, but we have to find other ways to assess uh, deeper, because we're saying deeper learning. We're not just, because standardized testing is not deeper learning. It's, it's a piece. So I think one of the things that, that is really lacking is figuring out assessments that really make sense. And you know, the, even the ETS, the College Board has, uh, in, the, in their uh, College Board uh, seminar, has developed a, a, a new way of evaluating an AP exam. And uh, I think we've got to figure out how to do that, which is not just a, a standardized test. 
So that's not a great answer but because I'm not an assessment person. But there are a <laughs> lot of people that are, and we've got to figure out a better way. Portfolios are one of them. It may take mm-hmm. more, more time, but we've got to learn mm-hmm. from it and do it a different way. Yes, there's a, a, a continuum of standardized tests that are performance-based. So, And yes. there are examples of, of fine um, assessments that get at those deeper um, learning competencies that I was talking about earlier. Would you like to add to that, Jennifer? Um, no, I do not disagree, uh, Maria. And I actually kind of took the question in um, a different direction around uh, assessments at the preparation level and accountability at the preparation level. So I'll, I'll just leave it at what Margaret said and say that I support um, exactly what she said. <laughs> Sandra, anything that you'd like to add? No, I think I, I, I agree exactly with, with what's been said there. I think um, with, you know, how do we elevate our expectations to make sure that the learning that's happening is really deep at all levels is something that we are, you know, continuously thinking about how um, how we make sure that what candidates are getting and then what they're being trained to do and being prepared to do when they're with students absolutely needs to go beyond the tests and the standardized assessments that they're doing. and. Um, I, I think in some places we're seeing folks who are doing that really well, and in others I think they're kind of more um, earlier on in the stages of, of pushing to that level. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Um, I'd like to take another question from the audience. Um, a person asked, how do you resolve higher expectations for incoming teacher candidates and filling the shortages of teaching positions in key areas such as STEM with te- with teachers with diverse ethnic backgrounds. And I think that um, Representative Benning, you, you, you addressed that um, with your opening comments about the work that you're doing in Indiana. So I'd love to, if you would address that and love to hear from others on the panel as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, great question. Um, Indiana happens to be a state where we have actually developed more talent than we need in terms of K-12, so we're kind of an exporter. However, we still have shortages in STEM, special ed. Um, it, it is constantly a challenge. Uh, one of the ways I think that we're going to have to be, if, if we're serious about really elevating education and profession, serious about getting more um, highly qualified individuals in the classroom, there's two things we have to do. Number one, we have to be willing to compensate them at a higher level and recognize that. And number two, we have to go actively recruit teachers. Um, I would challenge that most teacher prep programs are um, much more uh, the default programs in universities. They tend to be programs where people go who don't necessarily know exactly what they want to do, unfortunately, or academically when I talk to uh, President um, Daniels at Purdue, which has a highly ranked uh, teacher prep program, they had the lowest entering SAT and the lowest entering GPA. If you're serious about really quicker and really trying to go after the we're going to have to get aggressive about recruitment. And uh, in our example, in a small little university we have, we are actually having signing days for teachers. We have make a big deal about the fact that um, one of these, and we're going into a minority school, trying to uh, recruit um, high-performing uh, students into education. We need more kids of color teaching in our uh, schools today when 40% of our population is you know, uh, kids, people of color in the classroom, we need to have our uh, race balance uh, much more closely aligned. And I think it's going to take active engagement as well as maybe uh, when you talk about STEM, maybe uh, we talked about this on Monday as well, differentiated pay, maybe you're willing to compensate. We have several states. Utah, for instance, is talking about giving $10,000 extra per year to a teacher who teaches STEM. Um, They tend to be more rigorous uh, programs to get into. In terms of the academics, we need to kind of recognize that. But to me, we're going to have to be more aggressive and more willing to try to get the best and best into the classroom, as well as providing one of the other things that Linda Darling Hammond has suggested is um, trying to graduate those students in those shortage areas um, with as little to no debt as possible, so incentivizing uh-huh. them with state student assistance, et cetera, which is something Indiana has uh, with our STEM money as well as NextGen has tried to focus on. So Absolutely. if I can add to that, uh, one, of, one of the programs, this is Margaret, one of the programs we had, and I've seen others have, is taking folks who are 
early retirees from STEM industries and turning them into teachers. Uh, people are retiring, you know, in their 50s and uh, trying to figure out what to do next. And they may not want to teach full time, and that's why we have to be innovative and flexible. Uh, and you put them through a, 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 a pedagogical program. Don't put them right in the classroom. I'm not suggesting that. But put them through a, you know, a, a, a summer program, have them teach as a second teacher in a classroom, and then give them a physics class to teach or a chemistry class to teach just one or two. And they love it. The school system wins. Everybody wins. But you've got to be innovative, innovative with the school system and with the union to make that work. We did that when Polaroid was in Cambridge, and it, it worked out wonderfully. Yes. Um, I just read a bit um, more context here uh, in addition to what they had. In Louisiana, we um, absolutely are appreciating the sentiments of what you all are talking about. And most recently, we have um, tried to elevate the teaching profession, launching a statewide campaign um, called Be Irreplaceable with a Teacher. And we did that in high concentrations in rural, high need areas where we are really working with our preparation programs to develop strong post-back um, opportunities in communities where we can do much of what you all are talking about. But another layer to that that I think that we are um, steadily working towards getting it right is the mass production of work, workforce reports that can help inform our preparation programs about who they need to recruit and in what areas and incentivize through our accountability system um, uh, a structure that helps our preparation program work with, um, with our school systems to fill the workforce needs. And that's information our preparation programs have not always had, and that's dialogue that has not always occurred. Um, so we are seeing some positive traction around that, especially in our rural and high need areas. That's so key is to understanding, you know, if we're developing teachers that they don't need, it's a waste of resources, whereas it can be much more targeted and um, fill the needs of the district. So that partnership, again, is so key. Um, Maria, I, 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 I want to add one thing here. What, what we have learned when we think about lessons regarding that work, so while we are um, elevating the workforce, trying to draw more people uh, into the teaching profession, profession, and we're also trying to work to bridge some of these barriers that we have talked about between pre-service and in-service, an incredible lesson for us has been, um, it's kind of on the induction theme, that here in Louisiana, we have to have um, strong mentor teachers ready to host and support um, folks who are either new to the profession, folks who are um, have been recruited uh, or in alt cert programs or post bat through having strong mentors. Um, we have been working with Learning Forward, a sponsor of, um, of the call today, to work to create high quality mentor teachers so that not only once we get them there through our, our campaign and other recruitment efforts, they are in a position um, to, to sustain and that we, uh, we don't lose them on those early years through frustration and a lack of support. And so um, that's been pretty incredible. And over um, the last year, this year and next year, we'll, we will um, train about 2,500 um, high quality teachers to also be high quality mentors and supports as we ramp up our recruitment efforts. That is great. You stole, you stole the question right out of my mouth. Um, Sorry about that. Well. <laughs> no, it was fabulous because we were talking a lot about recruitment, right, and preparation. And um, a lot of the studies that we've done here at Learning Policy Institute um, emphasize the need for paying attention to the retention of the teachers and the high quality teachers. So um, I wanted to ask Sandra if you would speak a little bit. I know that Massachusetts is involved in the Diverse and Learning Re Learner Ready Teacher Initiative with CCSSO, um, and I know that part of the plan is also talking about retention. Did you want to share a little bit about that work you're doing? 
Sure, and, and as it speaks specifically to the diversity of our teachers, we're seeing that in Massachusetts, teachers are not staying at their schools at the same rates. So while each year 15% of white teachers leave their school at the end of the year, 25% of teachers in other groups, so teachers of color, are leaving their schools. So we're really trying to think about what needs to happen so that there is not a discrepancy between the, um, the, the rate at which folks are leaving and, I mean, speaking more broadly, and some of these questions are coming through about how do we retain our excellent teachers. Um, and so as it pertains to the diversity work that we are doing, we're, we're thinking about what does it take to um, ensure that school systems are culturally responsive, that the leaders in the schools are being culturally responsive to their teachers, and that the teachers are being culturally responsive in their classrooms with their students. Uh, and so that one component of our strategic plan is really um, scaling out the supports and the expectations that we have around cultural responsiveness at all levels of, of leadership and of teacher leadership as well. Um, and, and I think it's something, you know, Margaret mentioned career ladders and the importance of being able to identify uh, ways for master teachers to stay engaged in the classroom. And um, so we're doing some other work around supervisor certification and seeing whether there's a mechanism that we can put in place to, um, for, for as professional development for master teachers to demonstrate that they've got these skills to be high quality supervisors. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just exploring other ways as well to support that career ladder um, or, and help incentivize it from the state level while districts implement it at the local level. Yes, there is one other policy issue that I think needs to be considered. Margaret and both of you bring up the um, career ladders, but the other thing, when you start looking at demographics and think about um, millennials and how studies show that they are going to have very, a number of careers and how they're motivated, motivated by other things other than uh, money. And uh, so one of the things that we have also looked at in the state is how do you make um, some of their benefit plans more portable? Uh, and it would be very true when Margaret talks about having second career uh, people enter into the marketplace. Instead of having defined benefit plans, look at defined contributions that uh, vest much earlier and then they're much port more portable. So if um, the individual decides to come into the field late in life, it has value to them. Likewise, if, um, because you don't want to miss the opportunity for those great educators uh, when they're engaged, if, if you provide them flexibility, they have some ability to move around as opposed to, um, you know, the defined benefit plans that we've had historically have been somewhat more restrictive. I appreciate that, um, making note of that. Um, so we are wrapping up, um, and I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their experience and perspectives. I know that this uh, webinar was focused on bridging the continuing teacher preparation and induction for deeper learning, but I think that the ways in which we also um, talk along the continuum, talking about mentor teachers and supervisor and career ladders are key pieces to thinking about um, supporting our early career teachers, um, making that bridge from teacher preparation to in-service. So the threads all tie together. It's hard to stay um, focused when we're thinking about a full system. So um, I appreciate um, the rich conversation and um, the multiple perspectives that you all brought in. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank all of you, the audience, for attending the great questions. I'm sorry we only got to a couple of them, but we appreciate you being part of this important discussion and um, encourage you to continue um, to take these conversations back to your places where you're doing this work. I'd like to remind everyone the resources um, made available in the chat box will be included in a follow-up email um, sent to all of you, so that'll be available. And again, this will be recorded and available in a couple of days. Thank you once again. We really appreciate um, you all engaging this conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you.